I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. In this week's Case of the Week, a dentist tries to get creative with an implant retained Bruxer Bridge. And French teachers ban tooth sucking. Yeah, we had to look it up too. Pretty much. And I think we've found the oldest practicing dentist in the United States here in California, 90 years old. That and more on today's Chairside Life. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 139 of Chairside Live. We've got a great episode for you today with a very unique case of the week. But first, how are you, Megan? I'm doing good. I feel like quite the brew master. Why is that? Because I started uh, making my own cold brew coffee, mm -hmm. which has 60% less acid mm -hmm. than regularly brewed coffee. So it's better for your teeth and it's better for your stomach and it's delicious. Really? Did you yeah. bring any? No. Oh. Maybe next time. No, I, yeah, I'd like to try that out. Yeah. I've seen other people like Stumptown, you know, yes, those famous make, roasters uh -huh. that make it as well. Yeah. Um, and it does taste different. It does. It, for me, I like it. It's smoother, more mild, and they do sell it bottled, but I prefer to make my own. Do you always, do you drink it cold? Yes, I, absolutely. Okay, it's not meant to be heated up? Uh, you can, but I... I like it. That I like it. probably does something better. bad to it. Yeah, how are you doing? Assume. I'm very good. 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 Yeah, I spent a nice day with Gordon Christensen yesterday. I get to do that once a month. Saw some exciting new products. Uh, one of which was really exciting that we'll be talking about later on Chairside Live. Not today on this episode, but an, another one. I've ordered this new kind of loops that are Ooh, pretty amazing. Uh, they're, they're loops that, like I use ones now that are 3.2x. Yeah. These go from 3x, and you can switch them and go to 4 to 5. Oh. And it stays in focus. Um, the field uh, narrows a little bit and a little in depth, but pretty amazing because otherwise, if you ever wanted to do that, you'd have to have multiple sets of loops that you'd be switching between. So, Are they bedazzled? They're probably? not bedazzled, but they're just as sexy as the regular loops okay. always are. And awesome. uh, it's hard to look good with loops on. That's you know, why I asked if they were bedazzled. Yeah. Got a little flair. I haven't done that yet, okay. um, but uh, I think you'll like... I think you'll like how I look when I wear them. Great. But it's just the fact you can make teeth so big that's worthwhile. Awesome. Well, it's an interesting case of the week today because our my fellow uh, podcast host, Dr. Joshua Austin from San Antonio, Texas, has been nice enough to throw himself onto the grenade oh, and no. nominate himself for the case of the week. This is a relatively rare uh, thing to do. Not many people, people usually say, I sent you guys a case the other day, it wasn't my best, please don't make it the please case of the week. Please don't use it, uh -huh. um, Josh called himself out on this one, and okay. it's, it's pretty interesting what he decided to do. He decided to make some chair side modifications mm -hmm. to a restoration we had made for him, and it didn't go as planned, and then I'm gonna show you uh, uh, what we had to do, or what we were able to do to help him you know, get it all back on track and give him an option for what he wants to be able to do. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Today's case of the week is an interesting one because the doctor actually volunteered himself for the case of the week. He sent me an email and he said, you know what, I did something the other day, it's a little bit goofy and I screwed up and I wanna, I wanna take my medicine and I wanna keep other dentists from making this same mistake. And I said, I'm very proud of you. I don't think there's many dentists, I can't remember any who have offered themselves as the case of the week when they didn't do something right. So I'm gonna be very careful here to make sure that you can't see the name uh, of this doctor. Oh God, look, it's Dr. Joshua Austin, my good friend, uh, Josh Austin, who is also uh, my podcast host. So if you, uh, if you wanna hear our podcast where we talk about things like this, about being two average dentists, you can go to iTunes and go to Accidental Geniuses. It's the Accidental Geniuses podcast. And here's what Josh did. It's, it's kind of interesting. He had a patient who had implants on 12 and 14 and um, Josh wanted, scanned it with a couple scan bodies from us and wanted to do a screw retain bridge. And uh, our techs looked at it and said, we can't do a screw retain bridge but we can make you a couple custom abutments and uh, you can place those and do a cement on bridge. And Josh said, that'll be fine. I wanted to do screw retain because I don't like cement and the possibility of leaving some behind and endangering the implant, but I'll go ahead and do that. So Josh gets the custom abutments back from us, uh, tries them in, gets them down into place. They fit fine, takes a radiograph to confirm their fit, puts the Brux or bridge on top of the custom abutments. It fits fine, takes the radiograph to confirm that fit takes it all apart and then decides, this is the maverick spirit of a dentist here, decides, you know what? I'd like to make this a screw retained brain uh, bridge myself. So he does the thing that most of us dread doing and that's drilling through solid zirconia. So God bless him just uh, for that. And uh, he drills through 
uh, this Bruxer Bridge uh, all the way down and uh, decides that he's going to turn this into a screw retained bridge. So he takes the two custom abutments and cements them uh, into the bridge and cleans it all up here out of the mouth so we're not getting any of the cement uh, around the implant or in the sulcus. So he's going to keep it clean and do the right thing. And once this has been uh, cemented and cleaned up, he goes back to the mouth and you probably see the end of the story coming. It will not fit back into place again. And so Josh was like, oh no, I really shot myself in the foot on this one. So he sent it back to the laboratory and our challenge is going to be to try to see if we can get these custom abutments out of this Bruxer bridge. I'm, I'm sure we can just probably uh, uh, drill through and, and hopefully be able to create enough vibration maybe to break that cement bond. We'll see whether or not we have to do it. But what could Josh possibly have done differently um, if you decide that you want to turn a cement, <laughs> cemented bridge into a, um, a screw-on bridge, a screw-retained bridge, at the chair side. Well, it's, that's a tough time to make that decision and make it work. But what if he had put both these custom abutments into place in the patient's mouth, drilled the two holes in the Bruxer bridge like he did, cemented it on the custom abutments, cleaned up all the cement at that point, then unscrewed that and taken the bridge off. Um, would it have come off and would it have fit back on again? It's a little difficult to tell because he did a digital impression. I don't have a copy of the scan here, but he would have had a better chance probably of that bridge happening to fit uh, into place perhaps. He could have also got rid uh, and made these non-engaging. You can see where we've got our um, little indexed surfaces here. So had he wanted to make this non-engaging, which is fine for a screw re retained bridge, you know, to have non-engaging abutments so it'll seat a little more passively is fine. When we have single custom abutments, the way this was sent to Josh, um, we're always gonna have um, these because we wanna be able to uh, uh, index that and keep those abutments from rotating when the patient chews on a cement on bridge. But on a bridge like this, he, he could have gone in there and made this non-engaging by kind of prepping that away. But that's, uh, you know, it's a little scary to do to kind of prep away that metal. I mean, it's not, the end of the world. If you didn't think the lab was going to be able to use the custom abutments, you could you know, go in there and do that before you sent it back. So um, maybe one of those two would have worked and um, had he made it non-engaging, it would have went passively down uh, into place. But uh, at this point, um, we're still going to see what we can do to make his uh, screw retained bridge dreams come true. Um, his suggestion to us was, because he felt bad, just see if you can get out those custom abutments and they fit perfectly. And if you just mill me um, another Bruxer bridge, because the design has been saved, so it's very easy for us to mill an exact duplicate of this. He said, if you send that to me, um, I will promise to put it as a cemented bridge and not, and not prep some holes in it to turn it into a screw retained bridge chair side. So uh, we're going to send this off uh, to the technicians now and see what uh, they are able to do with this and see what kind of restoration uh, we're going to be able to send back to Josh when this is all said and done. Props to you, Josh, for being very honest about this. And uh, I promised him when he sent this in that uh, I would send in uh, something really goofy that, uh, that I do and out myself as a case of the week. He's getting a free restoration for this. And so any dentist who wants to send in and be the case of the week, whether it's a goof up that you made like this or something that you're really proud of, um, let us know. We'd love to take a look at it. And if you want to uh, send the case through the lab, we'll certainly uh, highlight it if you give me a heads up to look out for that restoration. So here is what we did for Josh. I always like to uh, learn something if we can when we do something like this. So we made him two bridges uh, that I wanted to show you. I can actually only show you one of them. One already got sent to him. Uh, kind of by mistake, but here, here's the other one. What they did was, you know, because it's a uh, CAD CAM designed, a CAD designed file, they were able to just mill two more uh, custom abutments, two new ones, and then mill another identical uh, Bruxer bridge. And so this is exactly uh, the same size and shape because it's the same design file as the one that was made last time, as are the abutments. And it kind of points out you know, something nice uh, about the whole CAD CAM process, and that is, oh, I don't know, let's say this patient gets hit in, hit in the face with a baseball bat or a hockey puck uh, and breaks or chips the Bruxer bridge, which is really difficult to do, but or pretend it's another material uh, and it breaks. Um, we would be able to mill a new one 
uh, for Josh and sent it out to him so he could cut the old one off and put the new one in at the same time. Or even if you're looking at an Emacs crown or a Bruxer crown, if the patient needs endo, um, you can have your endodontist or you can make a larger access opening or you can just cut it off and do the endo without the crown on and have us make a new one for you and, and send it out. And so it's one of the neat things you can actually do duplicate replacement restorations. And so here we have the two uh, new custom abutments that were made with the bridge that goes on top of it as a cement on system. Since this bridge had been fabricated with new custom abutments, they didn't have to take the custom abutments out of the other bridge that Josh turned into a screw retained one where he had cemented it, the abutments to the uh, inside of the bridge and tried it on and hadn't fit, but they did go in for him and get rid uh, and make it non-engaging. So they went through and got rid of all of this uh, on the internal portion. So he can take that bridge and try it back into the patient's mouth and see now that it's a non-engaging uh, bridge and it's been cut off by the lab and polished you know, very smooth, if in fact he's able to get it to fit. My guess is that both of these uh, will fit and he'll be able to take his choice between um, the cement on bridge, this one, or the screw retained one that was already sent out to his office. And I think just from the fact that he tried to turn the other one into a screw retained, uh, and go renegade on it, that he's probably gonna go with the screw retained bridge. But I just wanted to see if he could feel any difference or see any difference on the x-ray when he tries both of these in and, uh, and see if he could fit, find any difference between uh, the two of them. But it was an interesting case to see what happens uh, when you try to convert a cement on uh, to a screw retained bridge. It's a possibility you might be able to work, but you need to get uh, a lot of little steps right to make sure that it's still uh, going to uh, engage or remove those so it becomes a non-engaging bridge. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Don't thank me. Thank Josh. Thank you, Josh. Who's brave enough to share that. Thanks, Josh. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from Dr. Tim Huckabee from South Lake, Texas, and he writes, Hi, guys. I love the show. Thank you. In a past episode, Dr. D spoke about using Bruxer for lower anterior veneers. I did a case today on number eight. I sent a digital impression to the lab for my Caden Itero. I want to prescribe Bruxer. What do you think about this? Wow, cool. I like that, Tim. Uh, scanning it, you know, getting into digital impressions, that's great. Save 20 bucks, essentially 20% off your restoration from doing that. And you're right, I did mention uh, Bruxer for lower anterior veneers, and there was a couple of reasons for doing that. The biggest one probably, though, was I always hated prepping lower anterior teeth for veneers. Um, crowns were even worse. I remember the first time I prepped them for crowns, and you see those little lower anterior teeth, and you prep, 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 and I remember packing cord, walking away, and coming back in to take the impression and taking off the copper caps and being shocked by how tiny the preps were. It's like, oh my, what, the patient's teeth are gone and now there's like six grains of rice or four grains of rice there and I was afraid they might break when I took the impression. So they're such small, thin, kind of fragile teeth that being able to only have to prepare, say, three-tenths of a millimeter for um, Bruxer veneers and still have them um, be able to have enough strength to work for me, uh, is a really good option rather than having to prep more, say, for, for Emacs or some other material. So I like it there, and they're not super visible, you know, when a patient smiles either. And because we're usually doing multiple veneers or lots of veneers, they tend to blend in well um, with each other. Now, on your particular one, we're, we're talking about a, a maxillary veneer and a, and a single veneer at that. And so we're probably trying to match a natural tooth next to it, although you didn't say if, if number nine was restored or if number seven was restored. So sometimes when it comes to doing those single unit uh, veneers like that, I still lean towards um, Emacs, although I will say at this point that we're recording this in June of 2015, I'm becoming much more comfortable with how uh, Bruxer anterior looks, which is the much more aesthetic translucent version of uh, Bruxer, not quite as strong, um, still stronger than lithium disilicate, but not as strong as the original Bruxer. Um, but now you have an issue because it's much easier to bond to lithium disilicate like Emacs than it is to zirconia. You can successfully bond to zirconia. There used to be uh, speakers and rumors of saying, no, you can't bond to zirconia. You can, but the bond to lithium disilicate is going to be about 25 to 30% stronger. This is something we just got done testing up at CR with Gordon Christensen and Rella 
uh, looking at this exact phenomena using multi-link auto mix um, from Ivaclar Vivident as our resin cement. So you can definitely get a stronger bond to Emacs, about 25 to 30% than you can to Zirconia. And that could be uh, crucial on a case like this because most veneer preps are entirely non-retentive, you know, especially a no prep. That's just like taking a penny and gluing it against a wall and hoping it's going to stay there. So depending on how much preparation is done, um, there still isn't very much retention on a veneer prep unless you wrap the incisal the ledge and come over. And then you're going to get some uh, retention that's going to keep that veneer from being displaced to the facial when the patient goes into protrusive. And then you also have the aesthetic issues. Um, if you're talking about regular Bruxer, you know, Emacs definitely looks better there. Anterior Bruxer, you know, it's much closer to looking like Emacs if you're just doing a single um, veneer like that. I've actually taken kind of a, so you, that kind of leans towards Emacs or the anterior Bruxer for that situation. But I started doing a little experiment, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And since I get restorations for free, practicing here inside the laboratory, Anytime I would do a single tooth, whether it was a single unit crown or a single veneer, I would always make a no prep, have the technician make a no prep next to it and not say anything to the patient. And so we would try in the single unit anterior crown or veneer, give the patient a mirror and they'd say, yeah, that, that looks pretty good. And I go, oh, hold on, let me do one more thing. And without saying anything, I'd go and put the no prep veneer in and give them the mirror back again. And they'd look at it and goes, wow, that looks really great. What did you do? And then I say, oh, I put this one on it, we take it off, and they go, ooh, I want that one back on again. I said, I'm sorry, it's $1,200. You know, let's, uh, you can go ahead and swipe your credit card real quick. We didn't do that, we did it for free, but I wanted to prove to myself that you are, in fact, able to cover your tracks with a no prep veneer. And so doing restorations in pairs is probably the best way to nail anterior aesthetics. And most patients don't seem to object, especially if the other restoration is no prep and doesn't need any additional anesthesia and there's not a temporary on there so it's a very easy way to do it so i just throw that out there since you're treating just number eight that i always at least say to a patient there's a possibility we're going to have to restore the one next to it with a no prep veneer kind of like a lee press on nail if we really want these two to look good but the technician will try to do their best to get them to match so i always try to lower that expectation so can you do a, a Bruxer veneer and prescribe it for this tooth number eight? Um, you could, um, but if you were going to, I would suggest that you use the Bruxer anterior material. If we're matching a natural tooth next to it um, and we're just doing that, that single tooth, uh, I certainly wouldn't fault you if you wanted to prescribe uh, Emacs for that as well. When we look at our fracture rates on anterior restorations here at the lab, we just don't see Emacs fracturing hardly at all in the anterior. So uh, I would be comfortable with you prescribing uh, an Emacs veneer for that if you wanted to, to go for the most in aesthetics, if this is on a 70-year-old man who gravity has pulled his lip all the way down and you only see his lower anteriors when he talks and you want strength, then certainly lean more towards the zirconia oxide. So there is no right or wrong answer here. You know, it just kind of comes down to preference. And again, you got to keep in mind that you are going to get a stronger bond to the lithium disilicate. So if this patient shows a lot of wear on their anterior teeth from spending a lot of time in protrusive, that's something uh, to keep in mind as well. So if you want to follow it up, if you want to email me a, a photograph or any other information so maybe we can dial down a little bit more and see you know, what an exact answer would be, I'd be happy to do that as well. But hopefully just you asking the questions kind of stimulated some discussion as to what material you know, might be the best for something like sure. this. And yes. because he was nice enough to write in, yes. we have... Jim. I'm going to... I am... You don't get a choice. I'm sending him my favorite picture. Oh, no. Which is this. Do you like this one? I mean, it's spunky. It is spunky. It's, um, it's super happy. Very happy. I, uh, I don't think I was ready for the picture, or I think I was so stunned by what was going on next to me that... Right, um, you couldn't even remotely right. get a smile. But I'm impressed. And uh, Tim, I'm, I'm looking forward to this going up in, uh, on the walls of Huckabee Dental. Yep. And, uh, and again, if you want to send um, you know, a photograph or something... Uh, or just email me a picture with your iPhone even, uh, of that prep and what you decide to do. Maybe we can help give you a little better advice on that. And love to see a before and after. And if you want, just for fun, because I do this a lot for friends, and I now consider Tim a friend. Nice. Um, I will send you, if you want, a Bruxer veneer for tooth number eight. Wow. 
a Bruxer anterior veneer for tooth number eight. Wow. And an Emax veneer for tooth number eight. All I want you to do is try them all in and take photographs and you and, pa and the patient can decide which one you like best. But that's the kind of stuff we do here at the lab is we always want to see what's going to happen. I, I forgot to mention there are some specific times where I will do a zirconia veneer. And that's mainly if the patient has broken a PFM somewhere else in their mouth. So I already know they've got a lot of muscle strength or a tetracycline stained tooth or a tooth that's turned really dark after endo. Uh, and we definitely don't want anything showing through. That's where Bruxer really stands as out of the material because nothing will show through. Whereas with the Bruxer anterior and the Emax, dark stump shades can show through. Okay. Yeah. So send him all of that and some Texas barbecue. Oh, that's right. You, li you like food. I do like food. I and I love barbecue. That's right. And it's been a while since we've got one from uh, a viewer. <sighs> can't, it's, I don't think you can really send barbecue, but I just, one can dream. Mm -hmm. Email it. Email, email me some barbecue. some barbecue. Or at least the smell. Oh, gosh. Uh, any news? Yes. Okay. Schools in France are imposing a ban on teeth sucking, which is a sound made with the mouth common in African and Afro-Caribbean culture because teachers say it's disrespectful. The noise is a mark of annoyance or disapproval, and it's made by sucking air through the teeth past pursed lips while moving the tongue. The sound is commonly referred to as teeth sucking or kissing the teeth. Students were reportedly surprised by the ban, but school officials believe it is essential to help get rid of certain cultural codes that are inappropriate in the school and business world. French tooth sucking. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Yes. I can't do it. I have no idea. Uh, I think it's more... I, don't, more... I think it's more sucking. Yeah. Not to be confused with French kissing, right? Not to be confused, no. But this both of these... I don't know. That's weird that it would be... Uh, it's, this seems like one of those situations where you just have to wait for it to go away. Right. I think by banning it now, you've made it even more kind of exciting and for elusive sure. and kind of dangerous to it's do. Like, Ooh, and, let's do it here. Let's do it quiet so they don't hear, you know. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it's going to only multiply the number of times that the kids are doing it. What's the punishment? Do they just send them home? or they? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe detention or Saturday school or something. I'm not sure. But um, it reminds me of a time in seventh grade, eighth grade in my Spanish class when I was not trying to be disrespectful, but my teacher said something and I said, all righty, Spritey, and it did not go over well. It did not go over well. I wasn't trying to like demean him in any way, shape or form, but he didn't appreciate it. And oh, I was it had, he? Yes. Oh, yeah. All righty, I, th I, thought it, I thought it might have been a, uh, a female, but yeah, that's no. that doesn't sound like uh, that sounds playful, right? But still, he yeah, he he did not think it was very respectful, and so I had to pick up trash on my lunch. Oh, did you really? Mm -hmm. Hmm. In the uh, in front of everybody? Yep. Oh, so it was like you had been pulled over drunk driving. You were wearing the orange vest, like right. on the side of the uh -huh. freeway, like yep. we see. Yep, that's what it was like. But anyway, so yeah, so I mean, it to me that seemed like a minor offense, and this. Um, Seems like a minor offense to me too, but also it's out. I'm out. It's out of context for me because I. It, that's not my culture, so I didn't grow up knowing that or doing that. So to me, it seems odd. But if it's um, deep in meaning of you know annoyance or disrespect, then I could understand where they might try to limit it. Right, but in a world of dangerous internet sites, right. body piercings, and tattoos, Neck this tattoos. seems yeah. Uh -huh. This seems like a minor. Yeah. annoyance that's being given probably too much status. But then again, I haven't had to uh, teach in a class like that where it's happening. So Right. Okay. Well, let's hope it doesn't cross the ocean and yes. come over here. Let's hope American tooth sucking doesn't start anytime soon. Anything else? Yes. While many of us look forward to the day that we can retire, a dentist in California isn't daydreaming of vacations and golf just yet. The 90-year-old vows to cut back his schedule from three days a week to just one, but those who know him are doubtful. He has attempted to retire twice to serve missions for his church, but just couldn't help going back to work. He practices general dentistry and is known for his denture work. Dentists in his area have seen his work and are continually impressed. Wow. 90. Let me, let me say that, yeah, cutting back from three days to one, super lazy. You know, I, I mean, just, come on. But 90 years old yeah. and, the, the, and still doing it and, uh, and apparently doing it very well. I guess a stud. That's, yeah. a, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, Jim Glidewell, the owner of this laboratory, mm -hmm. could certainly 
uh, play golf every day, all day of his life. I was up with Gordon Christensen yesterday. He could certainly retire if he wanted sure. to, but uh, these guys have all found things that they enjoy doing. So they, it's not even like work, work for them. Right. They continue to do it, and that's probably why they're still alive. You know, part of sure. it, at least in the case, you know, of this dentist at the age of ninety, because he gets some meaning from this, and he keeps trying to retire and gets dragged back, back in, in again. Yes, and his sons um, try to take over his practice, and he just keeps coming back. And he's in Hemet um, and has been there for his whole career. And he just and other dentists in the area, like I said in the story, they see his work and um, are absolutely impressed that he's 90 and still right. has the skill, um, and it shows in his work. It'd be funny if they practiced together and um, somebody came in to see them and the son was going to treat them. Mm -hmm. who's 70, but the right. patient wouldn't see him because he was too young. Right. He wanted to see yeah. his arrhythmia. Because that's the problem I had when my dad and I practiced together for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I was fresh out of school. I was about 24 years old. Yeah. And everybody wanted to see him right. older and more experienced. I sure. just wonder if the 70-year-old son would have that happen as well. I know. I don't know. Get dissed for the older one. But that's the thing. You know, uh, you take an older practitioner, you take an older pilot, you know, all the amazing times we've seen like Sully land a plane, you know, on the Hudson River. Right. It was right before retirement, 64 years old. And uh, the older you get, it always seems like you can look back 10 or 15 years and go, wow, I know more. I understand more about this. Right. I'm better at this. As long as you don't lose um, your hands or your eyes and can still do it, why not? I, I think you just continue to get you know better as, as time goes on. And uh, right. he has to renew his license every couple of years. Sure. This, to me, seems a lot different than somebody driving and not having to take an in-car driving test as they get older and their vision yeah, kind of goes down. So, But now, I mean, even if his vision starts to go, you were talking about those loops earlier. Right, 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 right. Well, as long as, yeah, as long as his near vision and he gets those correct and there's a right. prescription and he needs it, absolutely. I mean, the eyes, um, you know, as long as they still function and he's taking it, you know, slow and doing it the right way, it's, it's not going to be a problem with age. So nice. that's fantastic. Yes. Good for him. Yeah. All right, that about wraps it up for this week's edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, everybody here at the lab, the CSL crew, Megan, want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 139 of Chair Side Live. We've got a great case for you. <laughs> hey now, hello and I welcome to. Oh, okay. I was like looking funky. Let's try that again. Hello. Hello. I want to. I want to hear this. I want to hear this how sound. How are you? Uh, I think it's more.